From bureaus worldwide, this is FSN. Thanks, Ollie. November 22nd, 2018. Of course, November 22nd is a red-letter day in history. 55 years ago today, President John Fitzgerald Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas. We'll talk a little bit about that this hour in a wider context. Happy Thanksgiving to my friends and to people I've met along the road who are American. Happy Thanksgiving. Hope you're having a great day. Welcome back to the most listened to independent radio show in Europe. It's your Richie Allen Show. (laughs) Who are American? What am I talking about? My American friends. Yeah, Turkey and all of that. Hope it's all going well. Got an interesting show, though. Tweet at Richie Allen Show if you'd like to take part. At Richie Allen Show on Twitter. That's the one. It's the Richie Allen Show. Broadcasting live on RichieAllen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world. And now, here's your host, Richie Allen. I'm really looking forward to speaking to the genuine socialist, trade unionist, human rights activist, broadcaster and journalist Tommy Sheridan who joins me in the second hour. I love hearing from Tommy. We'll catch up with him in the second hour. He's writing for Sputnik News amongst other things these days and he's got some very interesting articles about free speech and also about education. So we'll talk to Tommy in hour two. I know he's got a lot of followers in uh, in these parts so if there's something you'd like me to put to Tommy you need only tweet it to me. Before that, though, there's so much to talk about. You and I, dear listener, you and I are going to have a little stroll down News Lane. We're going to have a stroll down News Lane and look at the big stories today. And I've got some fascinating things to talk about as well. I want to talk about JFK and the Federal Reserve. Any truth to that old conspiracy theory that one of the reasons Kennedy was murdered, assassinated, was because he wanted to take on the Fed? There might be some truth in it. We'll talk about that this hour and more. And I'll say for the 500,000 million trillion time, if you've got something to say, particularly if it, dis- if it contradicts me, if it's something that I've said that you disagree with on these issues, I'm happy to read those tweets out as you know. Five minutes past the hour this Thursday, November 22nd. Yeah. All righty. Where are we going to start then? Tell you what we'll do. We'll start with the biggest story of the day. And this political agreement, this political agreement that has been agreed between the European Union and the United Kingdom, not to be confused with the withdrawal agreement. That was, that so last week, the withdrawal agreement. Overnight, May and the European Union have agreed on post-Brexit relations. They've had a political declaration What the hell is going on over to Sky News? Surely Sky News is the answer. They must have. Hello, good afternoon to you. Welcome to the show. Theresa May says she will do everything possible to deliver a Brexit deal for the British people. The Prime Minister was speaking in the House of Commons in the last hour as she attempted to sell the draft proposal on the future relationship. Mrs May said the proposal was the right deal for the British people, but the Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn said it represented the worst of all worlds. Mr Speaker, the draft text that we have agreed with the Commission is a good deal for our country and for our partners in the EU. It honours the vote It honours the vote of the British people by taking back control of our borders, our laws and our money, while protecting jobs, security and the integrity of our precious United Kingdom. This empty document could have been written two years ago. It's peppered with phrases such as the parties will look at, the parties will explore. What on earth has the government been doing for the last two years? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What does it mean then? Well, the political declaration is all about the future relationship, not the withdrawal agreement. That's, as I said, that's a separate thing. So May... The Prime Minister has declared this agreement as right for the whole of the UK and insisted that a deal is within our grasp. Yeah, right, that's what she said anyway today. The political declaration outlines how the how, how UK and EU trade, security and other issues will work in the future. And as I said, it was agreed in principle overnight. That's according to Jean-Claude Ever the Drunker. 
and the European Council. So London and Brussels has already agreed the draft terms of the UK's exit. That's the withdrawal agreement. May told MPs today it would deliver the Brexit people voted for. Corbyn, you heard a little bit of him there, described it as 26 pages of waffle, which could have been written to years ago and you heard what he said he said it fails it fails and falls short of Labour's six tests right and you heard him there asking what has the government been doing for the last couple of years earlier today earlier today even Theresa May said the British people want this to be settled I suppose contending that the British people are sick of it implying that the British people are sick of it Uh, they want a good deal that sets us on course for a brighter future she said That deal is within our grasp and I am determined to deliver it. Remember last night I was joking in the monologue last night about May giving away fishing rights to Europe? Well, she did. Well, she, in this declaration, which isn't a binding, it isn't a legally binding document, which also is very interesting, she basically does agree to allow European vessels to fish UK coastal waters which has annoyed our friends and neighbours in Scotland no end. And well, it might, right? Right, OK. What's the skinny on this? I'm down with the kids with terminology like skinny. What's the skinny on this? Well, the UK won't be taking back control at all. It's basically handing control of the UK's, let's say, economic policy, at the very least, to the European Union. It will not... Be able. The UK will not be able to agree the trade deals it wants to do with the rest of the world. It won't. And will be shackled effectively to the European Union. The European Union is getting everything it wants from these negotiations. It has the best of both worlds. It would accept all of this tomorrow if it got it. But it's also quite happy for May to be humiliated in Parliament when the deal goes before MPs, which may inevitably will be. So the European Union can't lose now. It either gets this, which is capitulation, or it gets some sort of non-Brexit in the form of a second referendum. This was always going to happen. Said this on June 24th, 2016. And I have been boring the arses off you ever since repeating the same thing. Right? So, May says, I'm getting what I want. She's not getting anything. This meaningless declaration about the future relationship is completely unenforceable. It's totally meaningless. It's like a promise to talk about these things in the future. That's all it is, right? So, the UK will stay in the EU Customs Union. It will remain subject to judgments of the European Court. And the European Union has a veto over when the UK can leave this crazy and completely unnecessary Northern Ireland backstop situation. This political declaration that May is talking about today is monumental bollocks. Not worth the paper it's printed on, no legal standing, and laughably, it's a loose agreement to have an agreement sometime in the future. That's it. Now, that isn't subjective. I know you will say it is. It must be, Richie, because of your personal feelings. I've always had the courage and the cojones to tell you when something is subjective. And a lot of times it is subjective. It's me, you know, ranting or it's me uh, kind of, I don't know, soapboxing my opinion on any issue. But this is objective. Regardless of what I feel, this is what it is. It's a declaration of surrender by the UK government. Now, Conservative backbencher Bill Cash... Sir William, if you please, had a warning for Theresa May after she'd spoken, after Corbyn had his say, Sir William Cash, a committed Brexiteer, would prefer, I suppose, to leave with no deal at all, had this warning for Theresa May. Sir William Cash. Uh, thank yeah, you, yeah. Mr Speaker. Uh, do, does, my, does my right honourable friend accept this declaration is itself is self-contradictory in that it insists on both the sovereignty of both the EU and the United Kingdom legal orders, and also that without control of our own laws, and by surrendering to binding rulings of the European Court, this declaration cannot be reconciled with the repeal of the 1972 Act, nor the referendum vote. And will she further note 
that the European Scrutiny Committee has resolved to hold an inquiry into the government's handling and outcome of these negotiations. Mm. Prime Minister. You. you. Now, the Prime Minister didn't want to be drawn on that one. Bill Cash, by the way, chairs the European Scrutiny Committee. He's basically threatened May and said there's going to be an inquiry into how you've conducted yourself over the course of these negotiations. Right? Right. Back to Scottish fishermen, by the way. Despite this being... Because I know what you're saying. Some of you are saying you can't have your cake and eat it, Richie. This political declaration is not legally enforceable, and yet you're bitching about Scottish fishing rights. Not just Scottish fishing rights, of course. The fishing rights of the UK. The declaration agrees that there will be a common fishing arrangement with the European Union in the future, which would give EU vessels access to British coastal waters. Something which has completely destroyed the UK fishing industry and has resulted in the loss of conservative figure 100,000 jobs in the last 30 years or more. Said it all. Leave it. Let's leave it. You'll be glad to know. 14 minutes past the hour. No more Brexit today. Going to leave it there. Unless Tommy Sheridan wants to... um, uh, opine on Brexit later on. He might do. But for now, we're going to leave it alone. Here's an equally serious story today. Very serious, this. And you and I have spoken about this for a long time. Mistakes made by the intelligence agencies. The intelligence agencies admitting after people have been blown to pieces by terrorists that, well, we knew about this guy. He was on our radar. We heard about him. We had been watching him. We've heard this practically every time there's been an atrocity. Well, today, MI5 has admitted for the first time that it made a mistake in failing to track Salman Abedi, who is the Manchester bomber. 22nd of May, of course, last year, the the Ariana Grande concert, um, where 22 people lost their lives. So what's happening here? Well, the Intelligence and Security Committee which is headed up by former Attorney General Dominic Grieve, has issued a report, and the Intelligence and Security Committee has reported that MI5 recognised it moved too slowly to establish just how dangerous Salman Abedi really was. The security service had caused to monitor Abedi's return to the UK from Libya only days before the attack on Manchester Arena, the report said, but it didn't. It didn't monitor Abedi when he returned to the UK from Libya only a few days before this attack. Hmm. This report has been very critical of MI5 and it said, the committee said the government had also failed to fully learn lessons from attacks dating back 13 years. So the the intelligence agency is not learning lessons. Right? Why wouldn't they learn the lessons? We'll talk about that in a minute. Abedi is believed to have been taught bomb-making while in Libya before returning to Manchester in May last year to construct his device. Now, I want you to keep that nugget of information close to heart for a minute. The Manchester bomber is believed to have been taught how to make bombs while in Libya while coming back here to make a device which he exploded at the arena. Keep that in mind. MI5 had planned to review the risks posed by Abedi, but the meeting scheduled... There was a meeting scheduled which was going to be about Abedi. This is before the attack. But the meeting didn't take place until after the attack occurred. Or I should say, to be absolutely fair, the meeting was scheduled to take place um, after the attack occurred, right? Here's Dominic Greaves, then, the chair of the Intelligence and Security Committee, speaking about the report today. Taking these issues together, we've concluded that there were a number of failures in the handling of Salman Abedi's case. It's impossible to say whether any of these, if any of these had not happened, that the devastating attack of the 22nd of May could have been prevented. But we can say that as a result of the failings, potential opportunities to prevent it were missed. We've seen that he visited an extremist contact in prison on more than one occasion. However, neither MI5 nor counter-terrorism police took any follow-up action. We've also seen issues around travel arise in the case of Abedi 
and other perpetrators. MI5 decided not to place travel monitoring or travel restrictions on Salman Abedi, and this allowed him to return undetected to the United Kingdom in the days immediately before he carried out his attack. MI5 have admitted that given the information they had on Abedi, they should have done so, and they've now revised their policies. Have they revised their policies? Why, in 13 years, have they now revised their policies? Could it be that they're a bunch of, of hopeless liars, maybe? Right? Before we discuss it, Sky News Home Affairs correspondent Mark White attempts to explain the committee's findings, and he has asked, how are the victims feeling about this report. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly uh, very concerning for the victims, their uh, belief that perhaps if some of those missed opportunities had been acted on, then one or more of these terrorist attacks could have been prevented. Uh, the This is, was really quite uh, a punchy report from the Intelligence uh, Select Committee saying that uh, as far as they were concerned, the lessons of intelligence failures really date back to uh, 7 7 uh, in 2005 when intelligence failures um, be, uh, around uh, some of the per perpetrators there meant they that uh, was never acted on uh, before they bombed four tube trains or three tube trains in a bus uh, in central London that uh, many of those lessons have not been learned uh, over the years. We've heard time and again after other attacks that have got through about the fact that individuals were known to the security services uh, but they had failed to act on the intelligence they had on them. That should be a big red flag to any real journalist. This is a Sky News journalist saying that time and time again the intelligence agencies conceded after a bombing that they knew the guy but failed to act on intelligence that had been given to them. At some point, you would imagine, in a fair world, in a just world, in an ordinary world, not the sick, twisted world that we inhabit now, but in an ordinary world, you would imagine that some of these journalists would stop believing the intelligence agencies. Wouldn't you? Does he have anything else to say, Mark White? Add on them. I mean, the difficulty for the police and security services is there are thousands of individuals out there who are described as extremists, who at any given time could cross over uh, to become violent extremists, and they have to choose with finite resources who it is uh, that they devote those resources to in terms of following and investigating. Uh this is a wonderful excuse given to MI5 by Sky News. The Sky News is accepting, not only is it accepting the excuses of the intelligence agencies, it's now making excuses for them. It's making excuses. There are thousands and thousands of names, says Mark Price, on these terror watch lists. And sure God love the old MI5 like, you know, and MI6. They, 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 they don't know how to prioritise sometimes. It's very difficult. Now, I'll tell you why that's a monstrous lie. You might remember last May, only days after this occurred, former MI5 agent David Shaler came on this programme. Former MI5 agent David Shaler. Okay, you remember, you all know about David Shaler. Um, and he came on to tell me that his ears basically almost exploded off his head when he heard the name Salman Abedi as the, the man named as the bomber at Manchester Arena. And he got in touch with me at lightning speed, David Shaler, and shared with me uh, documentation which we put on Twitter at the time, it's on David Shaler's website, documentation that revealed who Salman Abedi was, but more importantly, who his father was and the relationship that his father had with MI6. This is staggering. So MI6 and MI5 knew more about Salman Abedi than they knew about any other potential terrorist or bad guy. Listen to David Shaler speaking with me last year. Thank God for the independent media, eh? Yeah, no, this is exclusive, Richie, at the moment. Um, but uh, it transpired when, when Salman Abedi, when this all came up, it turned out that his father, Ramadan Abedi, uh, was arrested in Libya. And he's a, a member of what's known as the Islamic Fighting Group. Now, this man is also the agent Tonworth 
who was the gay, who was essentially the Al Qaeda in Libya member or the Islamic Fighting Front member, uh, who uh, approached MI6 to get the money to fund the operation. Obviously, he didn't actually take part in the operation because otherwise he probably would have been killed. But clearly, this is this is the, the go between. Now, this, this operation in Manchester, the bomb was said to be of a very sophisticated design. So we have an MI6 agent is the father of the suicide bomber, according to their story, basically. So the expertise he would have learned from MI6, according to their logic, would have been used in that attack. So MI6 is implicated in this very clearly. I'm not saying they ordered the attack or anything like that. I'm saying the expertise they have given um, is uh, help that attack go ahead if we believe what they're saying basically it gets worse because when you look at the whole abadi thing him and another three guys from manchester who became known as the manchester taliban in the noughties were traveling to libya more or less at will now these people are islamic terrorists going over to libya and they seem to, be able to go in and out of britain with no problem at all and each time they're going over their aim is to try and assassinate colonel Gaddafi. yeah and david Taylor blew the whistle on this it's one of the reasons he had to go on the run for his life across Europe. He blew the whistle on the UK intelligence agency's funding of jihadists whom they wanted to assassinate Colonel Gaddafi in the late 1990s. And Ramadan Abedi, the father of Salman Abedi, was part of a group of men known as the Manchester Taliban. He was working for MI6. This is all, this is all true. Every word of it is true. It's not conjecture, it's not conspiracy theory. So you add all this up, and then you listen to MI5, and you listen to worthless excuses for journalists like Mark White on Sky, giving an excuse to MI5 by saying they've got so many guys on their radar that they can't monitor them all, they've got to prioritise. Salman Abedi had to be a priority. And if you forget about who his father was, right, we learned, didn't we, only days after, only days after the May 22nd bombing last year, that Turkish, French, Italian and everybody else, everybody else's intelligence agencies warned the UK that this guy had been in Libya again, but that he'd also been uh, meeting with jihadists and Islamic State jihadists in other parts of the Middle East, including Syria how they could say that when he came back into the country and they were told he was coming back in, that they could lose sight of him for a few days, time enough for him to build a bomb and then go and kill himself and 22 innocent people in Manchester. When will people stop believing it? You know? MI6 knew more about Salman Abedi and his father than anyone. These are lies, more lies than damned lies. And of course, none of this would have made it across the table from Dominic Grieve and his committee. So, so just pretend it never happened. You know, this is the media we have in this country. See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. Forget about it. Facts don't matter anymore. Post-fact, post-truth world. The intelligence agencies have their filthy fingerprints all over what happened in Manchester. It's, it's actually incomprehensible for people. It's, it's distasteful on levels that we can't even comprehend. Most people can't imagine it. That they would knowingly allow, or possibly, because I can't prove they did, but that they would possibly know that something was going to happen and leave it happen to extract political capital out of it further down the road, as is one possibility. There are many possibilities, and I don't dismiss any of them. But it's untenable. Year in, year out, it's untenable that they can say these guys were on our radar. But you know, we lost track of them. Or, you know, we had intelligence all right, but we just didn't act on it in time. I wonder what the families of the people who died think about that today. Let's move on from that story. 27 minutes past the hour. This is the Richie Allen Show for Thursday, November 22nd, 2018. Once again, happy Thanksgiving. If you're listening to me in the US, I hope you have a fabulous day. All the trimmings and you enjoy the old football. It's great traditions in America on Thanksgiving. I know, I know, I know there will be people, including good friends of mine, who will have, you know, the lowdown on ta Thanksgiving and what it's really all about and slavery and genocide against Native Americans. I'm 
not deaf to that at all, but on 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 a basic level, for people it's a day off work, it's a chance to spend a bit of time with their family, and um, I don't want to be a party pooper today. Let's talk about JFK and the Federal Reserve. This is John Fitzgerald Kennedy, of course, the President of the United States. What is the Fed? What is the Federal Reserve? Now, I've spent time talking about this on programmes of yesteryear, and I've rabbited on about it. And, you know, this will be basic knowledge for some of our listeners, but for a lot of our listeners, it won't be. So I want to stay with this for a minute. First of all, I want to mention today a great friend of mine and one of the greatest human beings that ever lived, uh, Jim Mars, RIP. Um, Undoubtedly, if Jim was still with us today, he died in August last year, of course. If Jim was with us today, he would be on this programme now talking to me about this and I wouldn't be playing you audio of Jim, one of the greatest people I've ever had the pleasure um, to meet and to spend time with, the great Jim Mars. Now, Jim was in Australia some years ago And he was promoting a book of his called The Trillion Dollar Conspiracy, which is a must-read. I can't say that strongly enough. It is a must-read, The Trillion Dollar Conspiracy. And Jim was in Australia and the east of the world, and he was promoting the book, and he was doing personal appearances. And he gave a talk to an assembly in a town. I don't know where he is in Australia. He's in Australia anyway. Can't remember exactly where this was um, recorded. But Jim starts off, the great Jim Mars, the great Texan journalist and author, starts talking about what the Federal Reserve is. We're going to talk about JFK in a minute. This is Jim Mars. We got the Federal Reserve System through this man, Paul Werberg, a German banker who came to the United States and participated in 1910 in the meeting at uh, J.P. Morgan's hunting lodge on Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia, where he met with the big bankers, and they said, we've got to uh, set up a system. And they said, but we cannot call it a central bank. So what emerged from that was finally passed into law on December the 24th, Christmas Eve, with most of the Congress away for holidays and everyone clearly distracted by Christmas, and they rammed through the Federal Reserve Act in 1912. This created the Federal Reserve System. Now, the way it works is pretty simple. Congress authorizes debt. Congress says, okay, we need more money, so let's issue another $100 million. So then once they authorize this debt, then the Federal Reserve System spends a few hundred bucks on paper and ink and prints up a hundred million dollars and distributes it out through the country, through their 12 regional banks. Now they turn around and charge the government. Do they charge the government for the few hundred dollars they spent on the paper and the ink? No. They charge the government for a hundred million dollars dollars and we have to pay the interest on it that is it's just nuts yeah it is just nuts and the great man rest in peace explained better there in that 60 second clip than anybody has ever explained it what fractional reserve banking is he explained better than anybody has ever explained it how money is loaned into existence they didn't charge the U.S. government, the few hundred dollars spent on the ink and on the paper. They charged them a hundred million dollars for money that never existed. I've said this to you many times before. This is the debt economy and fractional reserve banking explained brilliantly. He talked about Paul Warburg. We talked about him on this program a few weeks ago. Now, Warburg is a capo regime. Well, at this time, he's not alive now. His descendants are, of course, and still incredibly powerful. Warburg, at that time, was owned by Rothschild. Why? Because, well, as I've explained to you before in some of these kind of mini lectures, mini lessons, Warburg's banks, his family's bank, was bailed out by the Rothschilds in the mid-19th century. Take notes if you don't believe any of this, and you'll be able to find it. In any library, in any good online site, you'll find that this is all true. So Warburg was owned by Rothschild. He was a Rothschild capo regime. Let's use the Godfather terminology. And he was sent to take control of the money supply, along with Rockefeller. 
of the United States of America. And you'll remember is that later on, Woodrow Wilson, as he left the Oval Office, as his time was up as president, said that it was catastrophic and basically said that he'd done the worst thing that any president had ever done. He'd handed the control of the money supply and the economy to a bunch of private gangsters. Gangsters. Banksters or bankers. Choose whichever word you want. Let's hear a bit more from this, on this even, from Jim Mars. You now have the Federal Reserve System, uh, which is America's central bank. Early on, they said we must never refer to it as a central bank. And now, uh, about starting about 10, 15 years ago, all of a sudden in the news in the United States, they just said the central bank today announced raise and interest rates, blah, blah, blah. And they just started referring to it as the central bank. And we're so dumbed down, drugged out, we said, oh, well, the central bank, okay. Don't even know the history and the debates that have taken place about it. And what has this central bank done for us? Ben Bernanke, chairman of the Federal uh, Fed's Board of Governors, was asked about the Great Depression of the 1930s, and he said, well, yeah, you're right, we did it. We're really sorry. We're, try we're going to try to do better. So they have admitted that they engineered the Great Depression of the 30s. In 2009, when he was asked by, before a congressional committee what happened to $500 billion in U.S. tax-backed credit swaps to foreign banks, he says, I don't know. Jeez, I had it when I came in. <laughs> And then pressed on it, he said, well, I really can't tell you, because that's privileged information. That's absolutely true. In front of a congressional committee, Ben Bernanke at that time did tell Congress basically to go and screw themselves. I don't have to tell you where those hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars has gone. I don't have to tell you. It's none of your effing business. It is privileged information. Here's something that you won't have heard before. Here's another man, Alan Greenspan. Who's Alan Greenspan? Of course, some of you will know, some of you won't know. Greenspan is a former chairman of the Federal Reserve. And when he was chairman of the Federal Reserve, he gave an interview to Charlie Rose. Listen to the question asked of Greenspan by Charlie Rose. And listen very carefully to Alan Greenspan's answer. What should be the proper relationship between a chairman of the Fed and a president of the United States? What should be the proper relationship between the chairman of the Federal Reserve and the president of the United States? Good question. What does Greenspan say? Well, first of all, the Federal Reserve is an independent agency, and that means basically that uh, there is no other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. So long as that is in place and there is no evidence that the administration or the Congress or anybody else is uh, requesting that we do things other than what we think is the appropriate thing, then what the relationships are uh, don't frankly matter. The relationships between Federal Reserve Chair persons and presidents doesn't matter. We do what we want, just in case you missed it. There is no ag other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. So long as that is in place and there is no evidence that the administration or the Congress or anybody else is uh, requesting that we do things other than what we think is the appropriate thing, then what the relationships are uh, don't frankly matter. It's all there for you. And I reckon one in a hundred thousand US citizens has any idea that the Federal Reserve is not federal and it doesn't have any reserves. Try to explain this. I've been at this now for 10 years trying to explain this to people because this is entry level stuff that 99.99% of people on planet Earth do not know. And they must know. Forget for a minute what the intelligence agencies are doing, funding and training lunatics like ISIS, destroying countries like Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya. Forget all that for a minute. Forget about it. Forget about forced vaccination. Forget about geoengineering. Forget about it. Leave all that to one side. This is where it is. This is the look. This is 
the rabbit hole basically this particular bit of information the creation of money and the control of money once people understand that everything else becomes fairly clear to them right this is the thing they have to understand but they can't understand it right you have a group of banks private banks basically owning the world's economy loaning money that doesn't exist to countries to get them into debt and then enslaving them Jim Mars elaborates here on this. Have a listen. This is, we're going to get to JFK in a minute. Because the Federal Reserve System is neither federal nor does it have any reserves. It is a privately operated operation. The 12 Federal Reserve Banks are owned by private banks, which in turn are owned by private investors, many of whom are not Americans. Many of whom are not Americans, and you will never, ever, ever hear their names on UK, US, French, German, Belgian, Timbuktu television. You'll never hear their names. Ever. Just like the five New York gangster families. Nobody knew anything about the guys at the very top. Never knew anything about them. Didn't see them, didn't hear about them. Right? Listen to this. This is the international scope of the money. And if you'll check on your own Australian dollars, you'll find that it's probably the same situation. And yet, it's been the Federal Reserve that has done the credit swaps, bailouts, promoted stimulus money, trade deficits. They sent several trillion dollars over to foreign banks. And when the Congress said, well, wait a minute, who got the money? What are they using it for? This is our money. This is tax money. And what kind of collateral did we get in exchange? And Bernanke says, oh, well, I can't tell you that. Folks, that's insane. Don't let that happen in Australia. Track your money. Find out where your tax money's going. If it's going to help the little old pensioner down the road, that's great. But if it's going offshore and they won't tell you where it's going, you got a problem. The trillion sent overseas by the Fed was money loaned into existence, by the way. Again, it's important. It's not real money. It's imaginary money loaned into existence. Just numbers on a screen. And it was used and is used to capitalise the Central Bank of Europe, the European Central Bank, but also the Central Banks of Nation States. They capitalise them. They capitalise those banks. So the Fed vicariously buys government bonds from the UK and from other governments, using subsidiaries and other banks, of course, and pension funds, which are controlled by them. Do you understand? Talked to you before about how the UK borrows money. It issues a government bond. It's like a promissory note. So these pension funds, which are owned by these banks, which are owned by the Fed, basically, this is how they loan money that never existed to countries to get them into debt. What did they do? Well, to be blunt about it, and to be a bit crass and a bit coarse about it, they leverage the shit out of a country through these loans. Then they bankrupt the countries, stealing their assets, their water, their oil, their natural gas, their transport, their forestry. Read John Perkins' Confessions of an Economic Hitman. John Perkins, God love him, and I forgive him for what he did because he had the courage to come clean about it. He went into third world countries on behalf of these gangsters and leveraged them in the way I've just described. This is how, when your friends say, it's crazy, Richie, it's mad to think that there's, there's a few men, a few bankers controlling the world. It isn't crazy. It's a fact. It's an absolute fact. It's a stone-cold fact. And I'll tell you something else, and I said this on the show the other day. If it were not a fact, and if I was lying through my teeth, I would be invited onto television and radio programs where I could be ridiculed for my bullshit. But it's a fact. This is how the world works. Did JFK want to take it on? Did he? Did John Fitzgerald Kennedy want to take it on? That's the $64 million question. There's a lot of division here. A lot of division. There's some very respected conspiracy researchers who, d who don't believe that JFK was really trying to remove or at least obstruct the Federal Reserve and its control of the US economy. These are respected people, so I have a lot of time for them. And I'm telling you now that this is my opinion, but please go and listen to people like 
G. Edward Griffin and others who disagree with what I am saying here get all sides of this, right? All sides of it. But I think there's a lot of merit to the idea that JFK did begin to fire some shots across the bows of the Federal Reserve cartel, but that he was very careful about the way he went about it. Now, some of you will have heard of Executive Order 11110. 1110, is that what it is? I might have gotten the number wrong. I hope I didn't. My, I, I copied and pasted, but it could have gone wrong. But anyway, it's the 1963 Executive Order. Basically gave the Treasury Department, which is not to be confused with the Federal Reserve. Treasury Department's got nothing to do with the Fed. Treasury borrows from the Fed. But JFK said to the Fed, to, excuse me, let's not get confused here. JFK said to the Treasury, I now give you authority to issue silver certificates against any silver, uh, whether it's silver bullion or standard silver dollars in the Treasury. These were called US notes. They were going to print notes. For every ounce of silver in the US Treasury's vault at the time, JFK said you could now introduce money into circulation backed by that. Now, this is true, right? This is true. So, as a result of that, at the time, there was about $4 billion worth of United States notes in circulation. Small denominations, $2 and $5. This is true. There was never any circulation of $10 and $20 United States notes Um because not long after all this began, of course, Kennedy was assassinated. Now, this is true, right? So, was Executive Order 11110 an effort by Kennedy to transfer power from the Fed to the United States Department of the Treasury? Was it by replacing Federal Reserve banknotes with silver certificates or US um, United States notes? Was it? Well, I think it was. And I think Kennedy was assassinated... 55 years ago today because of it. Because not long after he was assassinated, the United States notes that he had introduced were immediately taken out of circulation. Immediately. Lyndon Baines Johnson issued an executive order to overturn Kennedy's order. Again, this is all true. Have a listen to the actor and comedian Richard Belzer. He's written all about this. I read his book years ago. And he's convinced that the primary motive for Kennedy's assassination was that he dared to, well, to ruffle the feathers of, at the very least, ruffle the feathers of the Federal Reserve cartel. Here's Richard Belzer on Bill Maher's show around 10 years ago. Real quickly, in 1910, Senator Aldrich on his private train brought a bunch of billionaire bankers, the Morgans, uh, all these different people, Warburgs, down to this co place called Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia, and they figured out a way to create the Federal Reserve because central banks were looked down upon by the people and they caused a lot of problems. By creating the Federal Reserve, they convinced the Congress and the people that the Federal Reserve is a government arm. It's not. They borrow money from private banks. We're owned by banks. And you can't alter that. John Kennedy wanted to uh, stop borrowing, wanted to stop using the Federal Reserve, use silver certificates to determine the value of the dollar, and print money through the Treasury. So they exploded his head. The point is Well, that, that's quite a connection you made. Yeah. <laughs> Well, no, let's forget uh, we, the Kennedy we, we, part. He did want to do that. Okay. He did want to buy the federal. Isn't it the federal? I've heard a lot of reasons why he got it, shot. I never a, heard that. Well, that's the reason, and that's the scam. It's it's not billions of dollars the banks control. It's trillions. You don't mess right. with the banks. And but Senator Urban said this place is owned by the banks on this full of the Senate. You know better than anyone. Owned by the banks. Of course, it's owned by the banks. You're owned by the banks. I'm owned by the banks. Your government, wherever you happen to be listening to this in the world, is owned by a bank. It's owned. You don't have democracy. You don't live in democracy. There's no such thing as democracy. Every single one of us is a slave to this system. It's a fact. It's not conjecture. It's not crazy conspiracy theory. And I keep harping on this time and time and time and time again. Don't waste your time with people who don't understand this. Don't waste your time telling them about health, about weather manipulation, about vaccinate. Don't waste your time. They've got to understand this. This is stone-cold fact. 
and truth and it's very easily explained to people. This is how it works. You remember the economist Steve Keen, who's been on with me on with me a few times? Do you remember when I argued with Steve about this and Steve Keen had to admit to me and I've not got the clip handy but it's on YouTube. I've played it so many times, I'm not going to go looking for it now. Steve Keen said, yeah, you're right, Richie. It doesn't make sense for the Bank of Richie to borrow... Uh, excuse me, it doesn't make sense for Richie to borrow from the Bank of Richie to pay for Richie's daily activities. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? Why would you borrow from your own bank at interest, leveraging more and more and more debt on people and future generations, only for that debt to be called in by way of stealing all the real assets which I described earlier on. This is a fact and it needs to be understood by people. And on the 22nd of November 2018, 55 years after JFK was murdered, a flawed man, you know, often his supporters and conspiracy theorists, the airbrush out of history, the more unpalatable things about, about the, the man himself, and they shouldn't do that. Flawed he was. Misguided in some ways he was. But on the Fed he was right. And I think on the Fed he was making a move. And I think it had an awful lot to do with his assassination. My friend Jean Ann Crowley, great actress, who's uh, in the middle of a f f fantastic run at the moment. Play I talked about before about Countess Markovic. Um, great lady. has been listening to this in Cleggan on the west of Ireland, but she's missed the start of the programme. We have talked about Bernanke. And we've heard from Alan Greenspan speaking to Charlie Rose. I played the clip earlier. I won't play it again. We heard from Alan Greenspan basically telling the uh, presenter, Charlie Rose, that the chairman of the Fed doesn't have to worry about the relationship that he or she has with the US president because it's irrelevant. Because they don't get their orders from US presidents. They take orders from nobody. The Fed is above the US government. It's not federal and it doesn't have any reserves as the great Jim Maher said a few minutes ago. And here's a story that's related to what I've just been telling you. And by the way, if you disagree with any of that, feel free by all means to um, tweet me and tell me why and I'll read your tweets out. You know that. I'll always read the tweets out. Um, so there you go. Um, and share the first 40 minutes of this programme with people who've never heard this before. Share it with them. Ask them to listen to it and, you know, to take some time to listen to it and to cross-reference the information I've laid out with, with their own very simple and very easy to do research online or at their local library. It's all a fact. It's not a lie. It's the greatest conspiracy on planet Earth. And 99.999999% of people have no idea where their money comes from and who controls it. And here's a story that's related to it. You know, I mentioned homelessness on the programme yesterday and last week. Shelter, which is a charity for the homeless in the UK, has said that they know of 320,000 homeless people in this country. They know of. Wow. But it's probably much more. They say that it's rising 4 and 5% year on year. Wow, what does that mean? It means that every year another 15 to 20,000 people become homeless in this country. Human beings. Imagine the devastation. It might be you, you might understand it. It might have happened to you. And if it has happened to you, I'm sorry it's happened to you and I'm glad you're back on your feet. I don't know what it's like. I can't think of anything worse. I'd rather be killed then have no money to pay rent, then have no food, and to be sitting at the side of the road. I'd rather die than be reduced to that. 15,000 extra a year. It's worse in London, but it's growing in Manchester, in Birmingham, in Leeds, and in Hull, all around the country. Homeless people, families at breaking point, whole families on the street, and local authorities scrambling to find emergency accommodation that they often don't have to give them. What part of the bank's playing in this, I hear you say, Richie? I'll, well, I'll just repeat what I've said a thousand times before. Because many of the people who are homeless are people who have lost their house halfway through their mortgage. They took a mortgage out and lost their house. And they're so 
badly in debt that they can't afford to rent in the private sector. So they're homeless because no local authority will give them a council house to rent at affordable rates because they don't exist. Because they stopped building them many years ago and then they privatised the stock that they had with this ridiculous right to buy scheme where people bought their council houses and it sounded like a great idea. And then several years later, in the property boom, they sold their own council houses and fecked off to Spain to live, where they quickly went broke. But the council house they left behind is now privatised. So what part do the banks play? Well, they issue non-existent money. <clears throat> right? The mortgage is stressed. The family is in distress, can't pay the mortgage. What does the bank do? It takes the property back. But it does a worse thing. It commits fraud. Fraud. Because, first of all, it never loaned any real money. But number two, the bank takes the house back and makes a claim with its own insurance company. Yes, it does. Bet you didn't know that, some of you. The bank then goes and says, oh, the mortgage wasn't paid. We take an insurance policy out on every mortgage so we'll get the price of the house back. Banks are fraudulent from top to bottom as I've been explaining. What could Jeremy Corbyn do? The saviour, the big JC, the bearded one with the tweed jackets with the leather patches on the elbows. What could he do? Well, what would Hugo Chavez have done? Hugo Chavez, what would he have done? You know what I would do if I was President of the United States or if I was the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom? You know what I would do, dear listener? I would take the properties back from the banks, tell them to go and fuck themselves... And I would rent those properties affordably back to the mortgage holder. The houses would then become the property of the state. And the mortgage holder, who's now on the street, could have their house back, have their house back at a rate of rent that they could afford and that they could live on. I would then sue the banks to oblivion take their licence to operate away, take their corporate charter and burn it in front of their fucking faces is what I would do. And that's all legitimate. Any government could do that if it chose to do it. You fraudulent bastards. You screwed these people out of the mortgage you gave them. You've now gone and claimed insurance against a loss that you never had because you never put anything up to begin with. Only numbers on a screen. So we'll have the house back, thank you very much. You're finished as a business. We'll give it back to the people who took the mortgage out and they can pay us rent. That's what we'll do. But of course, Jeremy Corbyn will never do that. I bet you Tommy Sheridan would, would do that. I bet you Tommy Sheridan would do that. I bet you a real socialist would do that. By the way, this is the Richie Allen Show, Europe's most listened to independent radio show. My name is Richie Allen. The time is four minutes to six on November 22nd, 2018. Great to have your company. Happy Thanksgiving Day to my friends across the pond. This is Billy Joel just for you and we didn't start the fire. Back in a few minutes with more for you. Music from Billy Joel on the Richie Allen Show. I've just heard from Bob there who's a bit worried about his own financial situation. <clears throat> Sorry to hear that, Bob. We've had difficult periods ourselves in the last few years. Um, the future, Mrs. Allen and myself, we came very close to serious financial collapse a few years ago in Spain and I'll never forget the stress of it. I'm sorry to hear you're going through it. There are good local agencies that are helpful and I know, and, and I know this because people have been in touch with me before to say that they spoke to money advice agencies and agencies that, charities that help people deal with their debts and buy them some time and some breathing space. If anybody's listening to this and you're, you're worried that things are really getting tough and you're worried about your own immediate future, don't leave it too late to speak to money advice agencies that will often negotiate on your behalf with people whom you might owe money to. And that includes negotiating with your landlord. Um, or landlady or whatever as well so if you're going through it you have my absolutely sincere sympathy I mean you know I mean that it's a dreadful thing it really is 
Um, keep the tweets coming in. It's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. At Richie Allen Show on Twitter. I'll be joined in a few minutes by the socialist, uh, the broadcaster, the writer, and the trade unionist and human rights activist. I could say a lot more about him. Tommy Sheridan. I have a lot of time for Tommy. He'll be with me in a few minutes' time. I think we'll kick off by talking about that homelessness. 15,000 people a year in this country are being rendered homeless. Shelter are running a series of ads at the moment and they're effectively saying that every eight minutes in the UK a family ends up on the roadside, basically. You know, it's un- unbelievable. You know, we- we've often heard terms thrown around the media like failed state. Oh, look in Africa. Pirates are overrunning coastal areas. There's mayhem. It's a failed state. Well, this must be a failed state, surely. If people are on the street and have nowhere to go, no money, no house, no apartment, no place to put their head down, no food, how could you say it's not a failed state? Must be a failed state, surely, right? I would have thought so. I'm going to read a few tweets. It's at Richie Allen Show. At Richie Allen Show on Twitter is uh, the Twitter handle. You can email Richie at RichieAllen.co.uk, but it's not reliable. I've said this. Uh, a thousand times there to find out what other people are tweeting me and to get involved in the conversation the thing to do is go to uh, twitter.com where it says search twitter put Richie Allen show all one word excuse me <clears throat> the old voice and uh, Richie Allen show all one word press enter and you'll see what is being said to me Faisal asks is that a new version of the Billy Joel song it might be Faisal it, it's off a uh, fairly recent compilation it might have been updated I'm not sure I won't say no my friend it could very well be Um, yeah yeah I'm a bit distressed now hearing about people who are worried about being uh, made homeless I'm going to look into maybe getting one or two of these agencies to come on this program and to talk to people about what they can do off the top of my head I'm struggling to think of the Charity that's very, very good at helping people deal with their creditors. What's it called? In Ireland, it's the money. It's the it's the budget. It's the mo- it, In Ireland, it's MABS, isn't it? If Jean Anne is still listening, is it MABS in Ireland? Uh, the money and budgeting service, is it? Let me have a look. Um, it could be MABS in England as well. Sorry for talking off mic there. My apologies. Um, it's MABS here. It's the state's money advice service, and I've heard a lot of good things about MABS. A lot of, MABS exists in, in, in Ireland as well. Um, or is MABS just Irish? What's wrong with me today? MABS might be Irish, um, but there might be a version of it here in England. I know there is one in England because I've heard people speaking on national radio, people who've been in serious trouble, you know, who've gone to these agencies and they've, they've helped them out. They've helped to negotiate payment plans with their creditors and in many cases... They've helped to wipe out debt that has left people so concerned that they thought they were going to lose uh, their house. Right, five minutes uh, past the hour there. So um, I think what I'll do is I'll get in touch with one or two of these organisations and get a spokesperson to come on the programme to talk about it because um, 15,000 people a year are finding themselves homeless. It's, it's, It's a disgrace is what it is. So Tommy Sheridan then will be standing by. It's been such a mad day today. One of the things I didn't do. It's not like me either. I didn't put, I didn't input Tommy's details into the system. I always do that before the show. I put all the phone numbers into the system. So it's only a matter of me clicking a button when I want to phone somebody. Um, I don't phone people a lot. I usually just use Skype audio. But we do phone people. I didn't put his details into this. It's just been one of those mad days. Anyway, um, let me do that now. He says, this is very unprofessional. This is most unprofessional, of course. But what are you going to do, you know? What what are you going to do about it? Have I got it there? Yeah, I've got it there. We'll do that now in a second. Right, so if you've got questions for Tommy, I know Tommy's got a big following, and I know many of those who know Tommy uh, in these parts, in the northwest of England, and in uh, Glasgow, and in Scotland, wider Scotland, if you've got something you'd like me to put to him, I will put it to him. He's written a couple of fascinating 
articles on sputniknews.com check it out sputniknews.com these articles uh, about free speech around criticising the Israeli government but also around education really interesting stuff he's broadcasting with Sputnik as well is Tommy we'll talk about that as well this Thursday right six and a half mi- <coughs> excuse me minutes past the hour while I dial him up I will be professional for once we'll have another tune because we don't have much by way of tunes on the programme this is The Clash. When I come back, Tommy Sheridan will be with me. Don't miss him. Back in a couple of minutes. Music from The Clash on the Richie Allen Show. It's exactly ten minutes past the hour. Welcome back to the programme. Always good to be with you. A lot of tweets. Check out uh, at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. Tweet amongst yourselves. Take part in the conversation. I'll read the tweets out as I go along. Let me welcome back um, to the programme uh, somebody who I've got an awful lot of time for. And I've been reading him lately a lot on SputnikNews.com. He's written some terrific articles, thought-provoking and challenging articles um, for that publication. He's a socialist, a genuine one, I believe, a trade unionist, a human rights activist. Won't spend too much time telling you about the things he's been up to over the years because I'd be here all day. Broadcaster as well. Let's welcome back to the programme. Live from Glasgow, Tommy Sheridan. Tommy, welcome. Good evening, brother. Good evening. Great to have you on. Um, yes, I want to talk. Thank you. I, 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 I want to talk about the article you wrote about free speech in a minute. The article you wrote about criticizing the state of Israel, and I was really interested in uh, a piece you wrote uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, well, in fact, this morning, actually, not a couple of days ago, on education, which is hugely important as well. But before that, I want to ask you about something. Um, I got the heads up from somebody who works for Shelter, somebody whom I know. And they told me a few days ago that they were going to publish information to say that over 300,000 people were now homeless in this country. But that's only the 322,000 they know of. They think the figure is much higher. And the rate it's accelerating, it's approaching about 15,000 a year. That's people, including families, that are finding themselves with no place to go. And local authorities are struggling to find emergency accommodation for these people. I wasn't saying it for effect or to try and score some points with anybody, but aren't we a failed state, Tommy, if 15,000 people a year end up on the streets with nothing and nowhere to go? Well, you listen to the politicians at Westminster Daily telling us that we are one of the top four or five richest nations on the planet. They boast about that. They tell us that we are a very strong economy, that we can survive Brexit, that we are world leaders. And the truth is that although Britain is immensely wealthy, more wealthy than at any time in our history, the distribution of that wealth is more grotesquely unequal than than any records have ever recorded. And that is why, although the wealth exists, it's not trickling down to ordinary people who are being savaged by welfare cuts, particularly this introduction of universal uh, benefit, which is is a sheer and utter sham and is driving people not just onto the streets, which is bad enough, that's horrible, particularly given the drop in temperatures that we're experiencing. But driving people to early graves as well it is absolutely shocking. And yes, that constitutes, in my opinion, those figures, the fact that the number of people in poverty is now around 14 million, the fact that we've got United Nations rapporteurs coming to the country to report on poverty, for goodness sakes. They, that's what they usually do to third world countries, but they're doing it here across the United Kingdom because the level of poverty is now shocking and out of control. And what you and I, I think, would agree, and hopefully most, most of your listeners would, would agree, is that austerity was nothing but a con. There was no need for austerity. It was a political choice. Because while we could afford tax cuts for the rich, we were cutting wages for the poor and benefits for the vulnerable. And that is totally and utterly unacceptable. How did they get away with it? How, I mean, you mentioned the universal credit thing. I, I was outside Sainsbury's the other day, and there's an Irishman whom I know because he's Irish. That's how I know him. I'm Irish, obviously. And he's got a bedsit. 
um, and um, he's a nice fella, actually. But um, the Universal Credit thing absolutely screwed him to the point that he had to sit outside Sainsbury's. And he was humiliated, he was mortified. And he said, I can't believe I'm doing this, Richie. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely up to me neck in it. I, you know, I'm going to get kicked out of the bed sit because of the, the delay in payments brought about Universal Credit. And he said, here I am. You know, and he's, this guy's had mental health issues in the past and he's been unwell. He's a genuine case. And I just wonder, how do they get away with it? Why do they constantly get away with it, Tommy? Richie, if, if you read all of the reports of the pilot areas for Universal Credit... Because of the built-in delay in payments, every single area has reported a rocketing in the level of arrears for those in receipt of universal credit. That's just number one. Number two, what you are doing is you are taking what used to be money that was paid directly to social rented landlords to pay rent you're now directing that into bank accounts for people, many of whom have serious problems, mental health problems, addiction problems, and you're expecting them to be able to manage the money. Now, the fact is, without further support, those people aren't going to be able to manage their money, which is why the level of evictions is now going through the roof, and that's why your friend is outside Sainsbury's begging, and his dignity has been uh, shorn from, from him because of this universal credit disaster. People say, oh, but isn't it better to just have one big benefit? Well, I'm sorry, the welfare system is nothing if it is not able to take into account people's personal circumstances. As soon as you have a one-cap-fits-all approach to benefits, then you're obviously going to miss out many of the most needy and many of the most vulnerable. So I don't support universal credit. I don't want the rollout stop. I want it scrapped. Absolutely right. Tommy Sheridan is our guest, folks. Spotniknews.com, starting point to read uh, Tommy's articles. Um, I want to talk to you about this. I, I, get in, I, I, get, I, I get into trouble sometimes with um, Zionist groups in the northwest, they, they don't like um, me because of some because of some of the things I say about about Israel. I've never claimed to be objective when it comes to talking about Israel. Like most Irish Republicans, you know, we we take a very strong opposition stance to the to the crimes of the Israeli government, historic crimes of the Israeli government. But anyway, that's ne- neither here nor, yeah, nor but there. Richie, you do that because you guys know what it's like. Yeah. to be occupied by another country. That's right, and and the consequence of that. Now, of course, I grew up in Waterford City, and I was sheltered from a lot of what was going on in the six counties. But I, in as I got older, I travelled there a lot and saw what was happening in the six counties. That's a, a brilliant point, Tommy. A Dudley Council officer has been suspended because he posted anti-Semitic stuff on Facebook. So I'm thinking, right, well, he must have been blaming the Jews for everything. He must have been saying nasty things about Jews. He must have been posting stupid comments. No, he just said that he actually believes that Israel as a project is racist and he's been suspended. You wrote a brilliant article on this that was very balanced, despite, you know, everybody who knows you knowing how you feel about what's happening in Gaza. Your article was balanced and very well written. We can't be suspending people for this, Tommy. This is very dangerous, right? Richie, I was compelled to write that article because I have been enraged over this last six months in particular with the assault on the likes of Jeremy Corbyn, um, whom I have got disagreements over questions of independence and unilateral nuclear disarmament, but I cannot, for the life of me, understand why any rational human being would accept that there is a fibre of racism or anti-Semitism in Jeremy Corbyn's body. Uh, I know the others that I refer to in my article, Mary Bain Lockhart, a councillor, a Labour councillor from Fife, Jim Sheridan, who's no relation to me, but was the former member of parliament for the Labour Party in Paisley North. These individuals have been socialists all their life, They've been into racists all their life. Like, unlike some of the armchair pontificators, they've actually been involved in physically confronting the BNP and the National Front in the past in the streets, taking on the fascists uh, in, uh, who have been, been attacking the Jewish community. And now... 
people are rounding on them. And people say, oh, it's not a conspiracy. It's, it's just that uh, Jewish people no longer feel that they would be safe under a Corbyn government. What a lot of tosh, Richie. What a lot of tosh. Ordinary people, people in the minorities across the whole of the UK would be much safer under a Corbyn government than they are under a Tory government. But what we've got, in my opinion, is a coordinated assault on Corbyn, on the Labour Party, because the Zionists are absolutely terrified that you could get a Labour Prime Minister elected who for the first time is going to openly recognise Palestine and start to call out Israel for its continual ignorance of the United Nations resolutions ordering it to return to the pre-67 borders and to stop illegally occupying Palestine. Are you annoyed, as I've been annoyed and... I'll be glad if you disagree with me. It'd be good to have a bit of an argument, me and you. Are you annoyed that I think he's been very weak in terms of the way he's confronted it? And I particularly recall earlier in the summer, Andrew Marr had Jeremy Corbyn and kept kind of needling away at him on a Sunday morning interview about racism. And I felt that Corbyn, and I, I felt then and I felt now, has shown... I don't want to say cowardice, because I don't think he's a coward at all, I shouldn't say that, but a reluctance to really get stuck in and really take this on head on and, 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 and say what it is that's really happening. I don't think Richard, Corbyn has done I, I that. I wouldn't call it cowardice, what I would call it is weakness. Weakness, yeah, yeah. Because you look at the International Holocaust Remembrance Association definition of anti-Semitism, and you and I would agree with the definition. There's nothing to disagree with it. The problem is the associated examples, which are now integrally linked to that definition. Now, the Labour Party, up until a couple of months ago, accepted the definition, but didn't accept the examples. Now, unfortunately, um, the executive, national executive of the Labour Party, and it looks as though Jeremy Corbyn was opposed to it, have accepted those definitions. And those definitions create the atmosphere and the circumstances for criticism, legitimate criticism, of Israel's brutal tactics against uh, peaceful protesters, unarmed men, women and children, shot at the border fences, hundreds of them. And yet you can't criticise that because it makes you anti-Semitic. It is utter and, and complete nonsense, Richie. And yeah. Personally, I share your frustration, mate, because I, I, you know, I've got a lot of time for Jeremy. I've known him for many, many years. I think he's a principled man. I think he's an honest man. But I feel as though he's almost been browbeaten into submission on this question. Yeah, I mean, on the definitions, I look, I've been called childish in the past, and maybe I am childish. I, I, I can hold my hands up there are times and I'm a bit immature, but categorising some of the crimes of the IDF and bracket, bracketing those crimes in the same, putting them in the same bracket as crimes committed by the Nazis, I don't think that is anti-Semitic or due hatred. I think it could be argued that it's immature and childish. But I always say, look, if the cap... And I've interviewed Zionists many times. I've had great arguments. This is an interesting thing, actually, Tommy. These days, they don't want to come on and argue. But in the past, when I presented commercial radio programmes, they were delighted to come on and argue with me. And I would say, listen, what you're doing when you're, when you're putting children in a jail without telling their parents... You know, when you're shooting people at fences, all that sort of stuff. This is the stuff the Nazis used to do. So if the comparison fits, I'm sorry. If you don't like it, you've got to wear it. I don't think it's racist to compare what they do to what the Nazis do because I've just, just look at Gaza today. I would argue that's a fair criticism and that it's not racist. But you might take me to task on it. Not at all. Richard, I wouldn't take you to task at all. I do think all of us have to be 
uh, mindful of using language in an appropriate fashion so that if someone that you disagree with says something, uh, it's easy for somebody to say, oh, he's a fascist. Yeah. You know, he might not be a fascist, it might just be somebody who's a right-winger and, and you just disagree with them. I do think it's important that when we term something fascist or Nazi, then it's because it is fascist or Nazi, because if you don't, if you overuse the term, then it loses its potency. And therefore, it is not, it is not unacceptable to refer to what Israel is doing just now to the people of Palestine as fascistic. It is fascistic what they are doing. They are dehumanizing a whole people to then enable them to treat them in a disgusting and a brutal manner. That is fascistic. That's what the Nazis did to the Jews, to the trade unionists, to the socialists, to the gays. That's what they did in the build-up to their fascist Third Reich regime. Uh, and from our point of view, although uh, some people may say, oh, are you know, going too far, we have to say, no, those who stood idly by for too long, when they did try and intervene, the reason in my article I used the pastor and uh, the Miller um, um, poem yeah. was because if you wait too long to point these things out, then there's nobody left to fight for you. You know, when they, when they came for the communists, I never said that, I wasn't a communist. When they came for the socialists, I never said that, I wasn't a socialist. When they came for the trade unions, I never said that because I wasn't a trade unions. When they came for the Jews, I never said that because I wasn't a Jew. By the time they came for me, there was nobody left to say anything. And that's the worry. That's why people, I think, have a social responsibility to speak up now about the crimes, the inhumane crimes that Israel is committing against the people in Palestine. You know, uh, we have to say uh, loud and clear and repeat it over and over again. Being sympathetic to the plight of Palestine does not make you pro-Hamas. It makes you a human being. Absolutely right. And you're, 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 you're anti murder and you're anti slaughter wherever it happens. It doesn't matter what religion or what exactly. ethnic group people are. Simple as that. Let me ask you this. I might have asked you this before, but I want to ask you again. Do you think there's a difference between the left, as you knew it and know it, your family, your dad, your grandparents, yourself, the left then, as opposed to this kind of weird kind of progressive left now. I'll qualify that very quickly, then I'll shut up because my audience knows what my opinions are. They want to hear you, they want to hear me. I grew up in a family of trade unionists. Um, I grew up as a socialist. I suppose I, if I had to be bracketed or, or pigeonholed, I would be a socialist. I said to you before, I believe in the workers controlling the means of production, believe in a living wage, I believe in a proper welfare state, believe in decency, no war, all the things we believe in. I still believe in all these things today. I think there's a difference, though, between the left, as you knew it, and nobody knows more than, than you about this particular subject. You've written about it, you've lived it, and this kind of left today. Your generation, and you're not an old man, but your left, for want of a better way of putting it, was open to ideas that 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 you opposed. You were open to meeting with and challenging people that you opposed, even if they were saying things you found repugnant. You weren't trying to shut them down, marginalise them, destroy them or censor them. You beat them with sound argument, political debate and education. It's not the same anymore, Tommy the Left, is it? It's a bit different, right? Well, the, the problem, perhaps, Richie, in some sections of the Left, I, I worry about this term identity politics yeah. um, that, that has unfortunately found its way into the, the lexicon of political description. We used to believe in class politics. We used to identify issues based on what is the best outcome for our class, because our class is the majority class, it's yeah. the earning class, it's the working class, the people who create the wealth in society. And I know some listeners will say, oh, wait, wait a minute, I'm, I'm a teacher now, I, I'm a social worker now, I, I'm, I'm, according to the social registrar, I'm middle class. And, and I always say, no, mate, you were brought up working class and you were got an education because of the battles that the working class fought to get you access to education, you are still working class. You still have to sell your labour power to make a living. And I believe the left has allowed ourselves to become far too occupied with 
gender politics, transgender uh, politics, um, some of the politics that you're talking about in relation to, for instance, there is a, an argument about no platform. Yeah. Um, and I, I do not agree platforming with fascists. So uh, British National Party, National Front before them, quite frankly, uh, they are fascists, and I don't accept that we should platform with them. I, I believe we should protest them. However, when it comes to right-wing Tories or UKIP, I think they are leaning towards reactionary right-wing uh, politics. I, I think they are knocking on the door of Nazism. But while they are in parties um, which are, are, are not openly fascist, not, not openly Nazi, uh, don't have the Zikail uh, salutes at, at, their, at their events, don't wave swastikas at their events, then what we have to do is get in and among them and make sure that working class people are not conned by the charlatans like Nigel Farage. This guy comes along and pretends to be anti-establishment. Yeah. The guy is the bloody establishment. He's a multi-millionaire financier Absolutely. who's taken the piss. This guy's going to make a, a, a mountain of money out of his pension from the European Union. If he had any principle at all, he would have announced already that he's diverting his pension to some charitable pursuit. These people are utter carpetbaggers. And I think we need to get in there and we need to debate with them. We need to defeat them with sound arguments because there are plenty of them. Um, and, and we need to make sure that we don't see working class people lost to, to that particular cause. Now, if you were to say to me, should we debate on the street with people carrying swastikas and shouting Zika, I'm, I'm sorry, Richie, I don't agree with that. You know, yeah. I, I'm 99% I'm for the force of argument. But sometimes... There's one percent in me that believes in the argument of force. Yeah, yeah. Do you know this is hilarious? This in one way because there's a great friend of mine called Michael Cohen. Michael will be listening to this now, and he's a very well-known trade unionist in Manchester. And Michael, like yourself, is a genuine socialist. We had a huge argument one morning. It wasn't huge, really, because like like all good mates and like all sensible people, you walk away from a disagreement and then you you, you meet up for a football match later on and you forget all about it. But Michael was, was saying something similar to you, but he went a bit further. He was saying that, you know, the likes of the, the, the BNP, but even this English Defence League, the, the Zig Hoyle guys, the best thing for them is a good effing kicking, was Michael's response to that. You know, and I argued with him. And I said, well, look, there's a reason why these guys come into existence. And it is deprivation and poverty. It's also, there, and look, I'm not a bleeding heart's, you know, uh, whinger either. You know, I, I know these guys are dangerous. But at the same time, they've been abandoned, a lot of these people. Nobody listens to them. I'm not saying people like you don't listen to them, Tommy. You have, you know, real socialists do their best. But a lot of times these people are ignored and they're perfect pickings then for the right-wing scumbag to come in and give them all the easy answers, you see. So, I couldn't, I couldn't yeah. agree with you more, Richard. Yeah. You know, what you've just described... If anyone wants to study history, they have to look at the rise of fascism in Italy, in Germany, in Spain. They have to look at the fact that the working class, first of all, tried socialist ideals. They tried to go down the road of socialism and were let down by various leaderships and parties. And it was only then, as an act of desperation, that they turned to the right. They turned to those that filled the, the vacuum of the empty microphone and offered very easy and simple solutions and scapegoats. So you, what you're saying is absolutely right. I do not think working class people are naturally reactionary. I think working class people have got natural instincts of fairness, of justice, a sense of human solidarity. But I think when you're ground down so much, when you are living in poverty and, and horrible, shitty jobs with little prospects, and somebody comes along and says, hey, by the way, you know, it's the blacks that have come in, or it's those Asians that have come in, or it's those Polish that have come in. They're, they're the ones to blame. Yeah. People are looking for somebody to blame. Of course. You know, because because they, they, they need something to hang on to. Now, you and I know that it's a pile of nonsense, you know, but it's easy 
solutions and, and people will go there if they've been failed on the left. I, it was, let me give you a wee example, Richie. Yeah. Uh, this isn't uniform and we should never, ever um, be in any way complacent. We've got a, a march on, on Saturday, the annual um, St Andrew's Day march against racism in Scotland that, uh, that, that we, we've held uh, for the last 20 years because uh, the, the fascists up here and the old BNP tried to claim St Andrew's Days uh, uh, for, for their own. So we mobilised them. We, we made sure that they never got to claim it for their own. And every year since, the, uh, the Labour and Trade Union movement, the Socialists, have marched through Glasgow to say no to racism. And I would suggest, Richie, that the incidents, the prevalence of racism and racist political uh, activity in parties is significantly less in Scotland than it is in England and Wales. And the reason I think that is because of the existence of a left-of-centre political alternative that has picked up from the disillusionment of Labour. Because the SNP is now seen as the natural home for those who believe in social justice, those who believe in a progressive society. In England and Wales, let's face it, when the Labour Party abandoned the working class, what else did the working class have? They had yeah, nothing, nothing else yeah. as a political safety net. And sadly, the opportunists of the, the far right have filled the vacuum. UKIP uh, did it in a, a, a more organised and, uh, shall we say, devious fashion. But... Uh, the others in, in the BNP and the NF before that, um, they filled a vacuum that existed, mate. And so what I'm saying is that when you have a strong left, that is a buffer against the rise of the right. Yeah, when you go back to the 90s, you had a great man in John Smith, sadly died, and I know that will trigger some of my listeners who will, they've got all sorts of conspiracy theories. And then we got Maggie Thatcher, Mark II, the madman, Tony Blair and I suppose oh. any semblance of socialism went out the window. Tommy Sheridan is our guest. We're going to briefly talk about education in a minute because we've not got much time left. I'm mindful uh, that uh, Tommy is busy. Go to SputnikNews.com. Follow Tommy on Twitter if you haven't done already. It's at Citizen Tommy there. The reason my, my argument with my friend Michael got so heated, by the way, was because my, when Michael said that, the best thing to do with these guys is give them a good kicking. I suggested to him that by doing that, you become a fascist because regardless of how much you might hate these guys' ideas, they have the right to have these ideas. What they don't have the right to do is to beat people up, to scream at people, to wave sick oil in people's faces, to threaten people. They have no right to do any of that, but they have the right to think what it is they want to think, however much we might disagree with it. And that's why you 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 could bring me around to your way of thinking on sharing platforms with the BNP and all of that, or not sharing them. I prefer... You see, I love nothing more than seeing guys like you, guys that can talk, guys with ideas, meeting these people face-to-face -face over a lectern and annihilating them with common sense, Tommy. I lo you see, I love that. I've always loved it. But I understand why people are reluctant to go to a hall and stand up there with some of these people at the same time. Richie, you know? I think it's, it's, it's a, such a difficult tightrope to walk. Uh, it is, it is, anybody who says it's an easy question, you know, but uh, the, the problem about the whole no platform idea, I mean, I, for goodness sakes, I've seen universities now saying that uh, they're not going to allow platforms for people like Jermaine Greer um, yeah, because, yeah. you know, they, they, they don't like her ideas and people saying that they're not going to allow platforms for, for people if they, if they don't recognise uh, transgender politics and the right of, of men to feel like women and things. Come on, that just is going too far. Yeah. Freedom of speech is an absolutely essential right that should be defended. Now, freedom of speech, like any other right, has a responsibility. And if you're using your freedom of speech to call for violence to be inflicted against others, then I want to step in and say, no, I'm sorry, you've overstepped yeah. the mark. But if you're using your freedom of speech to say that you're a fascist and that you believe in fascist ideas, I'm sorry, we, we, we are not yet at the stage of locking people up for what they think. 
And once we get to that stage, then I want to check out a society because uh, I, I, I'd be locked up every day of the week if, if you were locked up for what you think. Absolutely. Um, so as these, I, these debates and these, and I'm, I'm not surprised you'd have followed with your pal about it because it's not an easy question. These are my black and white questions, Richie. And anybody who thinks they're black and white questions, quite frankly, is either immature. Uh, or they've never experienced the uh, cold and hard battles that take p- take place in housing schemes and housing estates and at, and at meetings. Um, what I would, would say in, in terms of what your mate said, I think there's a difference between saying to a, a group of fascists, we're not going to move to allow you to march up this street. In other words, we're standing for them. We're, we're doing a cable street. We, we're, we're standing for them. There's a difference between doing that and then defending yourself if you're attacked than advocating yeah, yeah, yeah. going out and attacking somebody. I think there's a difference because that point you're making, you know, we have to remember that if we are going to stay in the moral high ground, we cannot become like them where we advocate going and breaking somebody's skull with a baseball bat because you don't like the, the colour of their skin or you don't like their politics. Now, somebody comes to me and tries to break my skull with a baseball bat, they better believe I'm going to defend myself and I will defend anybody's right to defend themselves. But there's a difference between defending yourself and attacking ours. Good stuff, Tommy. There's loads of questions on this. I'm going to leave them because it's something we might get into in the future. Because there are listeners, Absolutely. there are listeners tweeting saying that they think that there are international groups run by vested interests that are infiltrating the left and infiltrating left wing movements. And I think there's maybe some truth to some of that. Um, and Tommy and myself have spoken before about migration and about the problems with it and about how. You know the people on the brunt end of it. How they, how they, 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 they show their wrath to the people who are not responsible for it. The migrant workforce yeah. is not responsible for it. The establishment is responsible for it, and the establishment is responsible for everything that we've seen as a result of it. We can get into all that again in the future, but I want to turn to education because your article was um, brilliant today. Pay the teachers. Thank education you. is not cheap, but it is essential. Uh, SpotnikNews.com. Um, just put Tommy Sheridan in. You'll you'll find all the Tommy's pieces. Education and teachers, it's it's been destroyed, Tommy, in on on this island. Do you worry? And before you tell me why you're so strongly supporting teachers today, do you worry that what we might be seeing is the old Chomsky thing? Um, in order to privatise something, first of all, destroy it, generate an well, outcry against it. What do you think? There's there's no doubt, Richie, that that Chomsky prediction and that uh, Chomsky analysis of strategy uh, can be applied to the NHS right now. I mean, yeah. that, that, that is what is undoubtedly happening to the NHS in England in particular. In Scotland, again, politics is different. But in England, I've got no doubt that the NHS has been deliberately underfunded and run down in order for some spiv in the future to come along and say, oh, by the way, we could run it better. Why, why, why don't you give us the money? My name's Richard Branson and I'm a multi-millionaire and I, I run an airline. If you give me the money, I could run it better. Yeah. It's already happening. Uh, and I, I would appeal to the working class of England and Wales, please don't be conned by it. Please make a stand. Similarly in relation to education, uh, Richard, that there is a, a big battle ongoing just now. Some 30,000 teachers and supporters took to the streets last month in Glasgow to march for a 10% wage increase. And many of your listeners will say, oh, wait a wee minute, you know, 10%, that's an awful lot. But in relation to the last wage deal that teachers had in Scotland. It was way back in 2001, so it's it's 17 years ago, and it set up a structure that would bring teachers up to a par with other professions. Unfortunately, because of the onset of austerity, changes to pension contributions, teachers are now 24% in real terms, real terms, 24% less uh, off than they were some 10 years ago. And we have to remember, these teachers, these professionals, they are not allowed to claim overtime. No. (laughs) They're they're, they're not paid weekend shifts. You know, they, they do the marking. 
uh, at night time. They, they, they do the uh, lesson preparations at the weekend, and they don't get paid for it. They only get paid the salary that they sign up for, which for a probationer is, is less than the average wage in Scotland, and then for a, a first year until about five, six years for a teacher uh, is around £27,000, which is not a major salary for somebody that's given up so much time to study at university and then has got the future of our children in their hands. Come on, Richie. I, I, yeah, you 60 know, or 70 years a week, Tommy. Yeah. value our children. Yeah. I mean, we, not only do we trust teachers because we send our kids to school every single day, but the reason we send them there is because we hope that they will turn their children into model citizens who can read, who can write, who can think, who can have empathy and compassion for their fellow human beings. That is a job of the highest importance. So why the hell is it not the highest paid? Why are we paying bankers and financiers, you know, telephone numbers, but we're paying teachers so low? I think we have to tackle that, and I've got no qualms whatsoever and saying that these teachers should get the, the full uh, pay claim. And people say, oh, where are you going to get the money? Where are you going to get the money? Do you know what? The average politician in Scotland, the basic wage for a politician is 62,000. Yeah, 62,000. 62, yeah, yeah. So they shouldn't have come bleating to me and saying, oh, where are we going to get the money? They should earn their bloody corn and make sure they get the money. Uh, whether that's through borrowing, whether it's through allowing the local authorities to borrow, or what I would prefer is they took the battle to Westminster and they said, hey you, we've had enough of you cutting bloody taxes for the millionaires and the billionaires. We've had enough of you employing 500 people in tax evasion, but uh, uh, 3,000 people on benefit uh, fraud. We want you to start raising the money that's getting lost, 120 billion a year getting lost for the Amazons of the world and the boots of the world, the big companies that are ripping the piss, Richie, uh, as, as the far piss, as paying yeah. tax is concerned. We need to get a battle now that gets real and starts to tax uh, the people who are not paying their way. Spot on. And I know some teachers in Manchester, um, wonderful people, a couple of women I know here, they're the first as well. They're not selfish teachers. They're the first to blow the whistle on the madness of the exam target system that we have at the moment, which means the children are not really learning. Teachers are speaking out about that. They're not putting, you know, their salary front and centre. It's great that you're talking about that. I mean, we've talked a lot about that on this programme, exam targets and how schools are becoming exam factories and how children are not learning things that we used to learn, life lessons and basic you know, basic things that we would have learned uh, many years ago. It's a really good article, Tommy. We're going to run out of time in a couple of minutes. Before we do, though, you've got that uh, protest at the weekend, St Andrews uh, Day, but you've also got a football match coming up. Are you putting the boots That's on? That's right, Paul. Yes, <laughs> on, on Sunday, I, I play regularly, uh, Richie, which is hard to believe at 54 <laughs> years of Fitter age. Than me. I play... I play regularly for a charity football team that was created many, many years ago of ex-professionals and well-known celebrities who got together to go and play matches to, to raise awareness and to raise funds for good causes. So we're playing in the Lark Hall and on Sunday um, and we're, we're, we're playing, playing for a, a charity that uh, benefits elderly, poor elderly people and obviously coming up to Christmas, uh, it's a very good cause. So uh, hopefully I'll I'll survive the day, Richie, and, uh, you know, I, I, I'll be walking bent double uh, on, on the Monday with sore legs, but uh, we'll, we'll hopefully raise money and raise awareness. Brilliant to hear from you, Tommy. You know you're welcome back any time. Any time you've got something to Richie, say, just please, give us a ring. Keep, keep me in mind, mate. If you're looking for a guest, you know what? I'm at the end of your phone, pal. You're a legend. Look after yourself. Have a great weekend Take this care, weekend. Bro. Thanks, Tommy. The best. Bye for now. Bye. That's the brilliant Tommy Sheridan live on the line to us this evening from Glasgow. To follow Tommy on Twitter, go to at Citizen Tommy. It's at Citizen Tommy on Twitter. Now, some of you are tweeting me. You don't need to tweet me what I already know. There are certain things that I wouldn't see eye to eye with uh, Tommy on. I don't need to keep reiterating that. You know, it's not a program where when people say things that I don't necessarily agree with, that I you know, keep bashing them over the head or try to score points. There are things that... Um, you know, you know, you you listen to this program every day, so you know there are things 
that I would um, pursue that Tommy wouldn't agree with and, and, and vice versa. You know, when, when it comes to migration and, and, and stuff like that and immigration and when it comes to right-wing thinking and that's just the way it is. That's the beauty of this programme, isn't it? We get to speak to people whom we agree with 99% of the time but on certain things we might not agree. It's like my mate Michael, we had this, you know, very heated discussion, not an argument, about fascism. I stand over what I said, you know, and it doesn't mean that I dislike or, or that I like, my, I should say, like my friend any less. But if you see people and you, however repugnant the things they are saying might be, and however annoying it might be to see them with their ridiculous swastikas and their sig hoils, if you think the best thing to do with them is kick the shit out of them, that's a fascistic thing. And my friend was speaking metaphorically. He's not a thug and he's not violent and he doesn't, you know, believe in violence and he's not going to go and give somebody a kicking. He was speaking figuratively. But there are those who claim to be on the left who think that the response to far-right people is to give them a hiding. Well, no. Piss off. Stick that up your arse. That's not the right thing to do. The right thing to do is to argue with these people is to defeat what you think is a redundant ideology through debate, through rational debate, through rational argument. It's how I prefer to operate. And not in a snobby way, like you think you know everything. Because I don't know everything. I know less than nothing. If I knew I knew nothing, that would be something. This world is crazy. Um, but there are things, there are ideologies that I disagree with. I don't want us to get into a place where open-minded people who want to listen to people they disagree with can be called racist, not because of what they say, but because of the company they keep. You're boring me, Richie. Yeah, I know I said this recently, I'm well aware of it, but it's important. I've been criticised, it doesn't bother me, I've got very thick skin, but certain groups in this part of the world in the northwest have criticized me heavily because of people whom I've interviewed. We can never tolerate that. Presenters can never tolerate that. Journalists can never tolerate that. A identity group saying, you are a fascist because you interviewed him. No, you can fuck off for a start. I'll speak to whomever I want to speak with. You know, they want to introduce or they want to create a paradigm where if you're sitting with somebody, eating dinner with them, therefore you must absolutely agree 100% with every idea, with every opinion that your dinner companion has. That's the world they want to create. You, you can only surround yourself with the righteous and the decent and the, the moral crusaders. You can't speak to anybody else because if you do... Well, we're suspicious about you. I'll continue to talk to people who say the Holocaust never happened, even though I don't agree with them. I will challenge them. I will ask them to tell me why they think that. And then we'll talk about other things. Not because I'm some sort of, you know, special person, but I'm just not going to ever tolerate this notion that people, you know, should be completely ignored and left to their own devices. I want to speak to people like that. Why do you think like that? Where did you get that from? You know, why? Why do you think that a group of people, a group of religious worshippers, why do you think they're the devil incarnate? Why do you think that? I don't agree with it. Let's have a discussion about it. Six and a half minutes to the top of the hour. It's the way it used to be. I said this the other day. It used to be like that. Now this progressive left, which Tommy and I touched on earlier on, they want to sanitize the world and make the only palatable discussion that which they have given a green light to. You can talk about that, that's okay, so long as you have this opinion. Well, no. No, let's not live like that. Let's embrace, you know, the fact that there are people who disagree with us. Let's embrace the fact that you're living in a community and around you there will be people who hate blacks. There will be. 
there will be people who blame Pakistanis for stuff. There will be people who hate, um, you could say, hate Jews. There'll be people who hate the Irish. Why would you hate the Irish? I've asked this question a thousand times. What do you want to do about that? Tommy Sheridan said it. You can't lock them up. You've got to live with them. You've got to coexist with them. You've got to work with them because they're working in the same companies you're working for. And you've got to tolerate them. That's what you have to do, I think, anyway, for what it's worth. That's nearly it for today's programme. Um, now, I was left down by a guest very late on Monday. Monday was a mad day. And I said I would do a programme tomorrow. I still might, provisionally, I might be on air tomorrow. But one or two things have come up. There's one or two bits of bits of administration I need to do. And I've got to see somebody about potentially advertising with the programme in the new year. So I might be tight for time. We'll see. Follow me on Twitter. If you do, you, you'll see. I'll tweet tomorrow what I'm doing. Um, and I'll let you know if I'm going to do something tomorrow or not. I might do. I might not. We'll see how it goes. Either way, you can expect me as usual on the Richie Allen Show Sunday View programme on Sunday at 11 a.m. UK time. That's 11 a.m. on Sunday. Please take the first, um, take tonight's programme on podcast or on YouTube and share the first, share all of it. People should hear what Tommy Sheridan had to say, but share the first 45, 50 minutes with them. That explanation of JFK, the Federal Reserve, the the banking system, the establishment, it's a great entry level for people who've never considered any of that sort of thing before. The programme will be on Podomatic in about 20 to 25 minutes time. Uh, it's usually on a bit earlier, but I'm putting it on YouTube first because the YouTube upload takes ages. So it'll be on Podomatic shortly, about 25 past uh, 7 UK time. And around about 10pm this evening, the YouTube version of today's programme will be available to listen to on YouTube. Look, I'll let you know about tomorrow. Tomorrow, in the meantime, happy Thanksgiving, Yankees. Have a lovely Thanksgiving Thursday with your family and your friends, the turkey and all of that. And uh, we'll talk, at the very least, we'll talk on Sunday, as I said. In the meantime, look after yourselves and one another. Going out with, bizarrely, the Scorpions. Why not, eh? Just came to me. The Scorpions. See you soon. Bye for now. Thanks, Tommy Sheridan, by the way, at Citizen Tommy on Twitter. Thanks, Tommy. Bye now.